Thank you. Uh, good morning. Um, as the title suggests, I am here to talk about measuring, um, measuring the success of, of, of your brand campaigns, your marketing campaigns. Um, a quick introduction about myself. Um, I've actually been at Google uh, now for uh, just over a year. Um, and before Google, I spent 13 years working um, at various media agencies um, across a range of different clients, everything from entertainment to FMCG to financial uh, clients. Um, and my time at Google, I have spent largely working um, in the agency team, so representing and looking after agencies. Um, and I want to talk to you today about the emphasis and the importance that Google puts on helping and working with you to measure the success of your campaigns. Um, and I want to talk to you about the frameworks that we put in place and how we can work with you to help understand how we better do it. Uh, and importantly, the tools we've developed and the research and the studies we've done uh, to show the effectiveness of campaigns. Now, when I was at agencies, when I was working for agencies, I'm, uh, I'm ashamed to admit that when it came to measurement, if I'm honest, a lot of the time, it was a bit of an afterthought in the planning process. Um, and I like to think I wasn't alone in that. I think that that was generally something that used to happen quite a lot, in that you would develop the plan, you would think about what you were doing, and then you would think about how to measure the plan. Um, and I think a lot of the reason for that was because you always kind of knew that if you had TV on the plan and if you were using TV within your media mix, you could be fairly confident that if your weights were right and your creative wasn't absolutely terrible, that your campaign was going to tick the success and the metrics. And any other media that you had on there, you just kind of hoped would, would tick along. Now, that was a terrible mindset to have 10 years ago. Uh, it's a criminal mindset to have now. Um, I think that it would be a very brave CEO or CMO that would stand up now and say, I know that half of my advertising budget is wasted, I just don't know which half. Because we live in an age of accountability, we live in an age where we can measure everything. That would be a very brave or a very stupid thing to say and admit to. Um, so. What I want to talk about is how the landscape has changed and therefore how the emphasis and the emphasis we put on measurement um, has increased. But before doing that, um, we love brands. Uh, that's why we're all here. Uh, we love brands as Google. I hope you're kind of getting that sense from these two days about the importance that we actually place on brands and working with brands. And I would sense that everyone in this room, because of your presence here and the careers you've chosen, you must also love brands as well because it is your job, it's your day-to-day, -day, it's the way you think. Uh, but actually also, as consumers, we love brands. That's why brands exist. We all know this. We don't really buy with a rational mind. Very, very small amount of our thinking that we do is actually done with a rational mind. It's all to do with an emotional. We know that. And that's why it can be very difficult to really track and understand the impact that different channels are having on contributing to brand fame and brand loyalty. Because it's hard to really isolate and understand the moments that make the difference. And actually, if we're honest, there isn't really, or there is very rarely, one moment that will ever make the difference. And I was trying to think of examples where you could pinpoint it. And unfortunately, both the examples I came up with were fairly negative. So um, I don't know if anyone remembers, um, uh, shows my age, but back in the 90s when Gerald Ratner was unfortunate enough to say to a, a room full of press that his product was largely crap. Um, and basically almost destroyed his brand overnight. Um, one moment where you could probably really pinpoint the communication that made a difference to people's emotional connection to the brand. But those moments are far and few between. So therefore, tracking success and tracking how successful we are being uh, contributing and brand building is a very difficult thing to do. Now, thankfully, um, an awful lot of time and effort has been put into understanding what contributes to building strong brands. Um, so I don't know if any of you are familiar with the work that Les Burnett and Peter Walk have done, the long and short of it. Uh, Les Burnett has also uh, published a paper called In the Era of Accountability. Um, now what's really interesting about these papers um, and the work that they've done is they've used as source material um, the IPA effectiveness studies. So have used over 800 studies across 73 different sectors, I believe, uh, looking at understanding the different um, marketing mix and how it will contribute to building a brand. 
And there's several different uh, key learnings and trends that they pull out that you would need to focus on and that you should focus on. And for the purpose of the day, um, there's three that I really wanted to talk about because I think these are the ones that help us understand our channel mix and what an effective channel mix is and, and how we can judge success. So Bill Brand Fane, focus on the emotional, and it's a long-term game. Now, on the face of it, they all feel kind of intuitively like good common sense in terms of if you're going to build a brand, make it famous. Make it a brand that people talk about outside of your existing campaign. Not always the easiest thing to do um, because it comes down to the last point. A lot of the time, we are kind of hardwired into short-term metrics. We are hardwired into understanding the impact on sales or the impact of a short-term metric because that's the way we are sometimes judged. And as we were saying before, focus on the emotional. It's important to develop a clear emotional connection with your brand as part of your marketing mix. Now, interesting, when you look at that research and you look at the work that's been done, and a lot of it is clearly looking retrospectively at the last 20 years, um, there is one medium that comes out time and time again but has proven to work really well. Uh, and that medium is TV. It's no great surprises. Audiovisual content is possibly one of the greatest uh, propaganda tools you can ever use to convince anyone of anything. And that is not going to change. There is no point in us pretending that audiovisual content is going to ever be anything other than a brilliant tool at driving brand love and brand awareness. But I wanted to kind of talk just a little bit, and I, I promise you this is not a plug for um, Chromecast, although it is an absolutely brilliant gadget if you don't already have it. Um, it is an amazing tool. But I did just want to talk a bit about TV and the way that TV is changing, because obviously there's a lot of talk about mobile, and rightly so, because mobile is clearly changing a lot of media consumption and the way that we work. But actually, if we think about TV just for a second, that's still one of the most dominant mediums in the UK, and yet all figures from most markets across a lot of different audiences are genuinely showing us the same picture time and time again. You are kind of seeing decline in traditional TV viewing in the way that people are traditionally viewing in the home. And what is interesting is actually the role of TV in the way people are using their TVs is changing. So there's kind of a bit of a changing of the guard when we look at the media landscape and the way that it works. And we know this, we kind of understand it. We all know that there are new kind of channels, there's new sort of platforms. But these aren't going to change. The way that you build a brand and the way that you develop a brand is not going to change. And we know that audiovisual content is important, but what we do need to do is to think about how we adapt our thinking around these areas to move away from thinking that it's purely broadcast media but is capable of delivering these, because clearly more and more media is becoming digital. And I think, I think at the moment, as an industry, we have been sometimes a little bit guilty of kind of boxing ourselves into a corner because the immediate gift of digital media, the immediate gift is the data that it sends back to us. Uh, so we can look at click-through rates, we can look at likes, we can look at views, we can look at page rankings, uh, we can look at shares. There's a whole different type of metric that we can look at and report on and think about and deal with which is wonderful. There is a whole level, sophisticated level of targeting that we've never had before, which is fantastic. It's, but it has led, I think, to a mindset that kind of can say digital media is absolutely brilliant at tracking and helping us understand sales. It's brilliant at understanding that last moment if you want the moment of truth when people are going to consume. Um, and that traditional media, your big billboards, your TV campaigns, your... Um, I can't even remember any traditional media anymore, but the big media formats, your double page spreads, um, those are the ones that are going to kind of build brand fame and they're going to kind of build brand engagement. Um, and I think if we, if we think like that and we maintain that, what you end up with is even when digital channels are being used to try and build brands, some of the metrics that we're using and the way we're judging them are still quite short term. We're still using the same language to think about it and it's giving an unfair representation of the impact that digital media is having on your overall brand plan. So, how at Google do we go about thinking how to kind of unlock and address that problem? Um, so I'm aware you've had a, 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 a couple of frameworks put up um, throughout these two days, but there's one more that I wanted to share with you. Um, 
that since I've been working at Google, I have found unbelievably helpful in helping me to really sort of unpick uh, what my plan is doing and then design um, a measurement plan around it. So here it is. See, think, do, care. Uh, four very simple stages um, of thinking about uh, consumer mindset uh, with your brand. Um, and what I'll do is I will walk through each one of these different stages. Um, and last night when I was thinking about it, I thought actually it would be helpful if I kind of gave you uh, top line examples of how that might work for different brands. And funnily enough, as I was thinking about it, I thought, well, a hotel brand, as I was in a hotel at the time, and an alcoholic drink brand would probably be two good examples. Uh, so I will, I will give examples as I walk through it. Um, and where this really uh, plays into is we, is we think back to the brand fame and it's a long-term game and how that works. I think this helps us organise our thinking in terms of what it is that we want the different channels to do and how we want them to work together. So to begin with, C. C, you need to think about your largest addressable qualified audience. Um, and increasingly, there's a lot of work done. And when you think about brand fame, previously there's been a real, like, how can we define the audience? What can we do? How can we narrow down it? And then how can we buy broadcast media to reach this retargeted audience? Actually, if digital has given us anything, and it's given us a lot, it's the ability to actually define quite broad audiences but target them really effectively. So in thinking about your largest addressable qualified audience, if I was to think of a hotel brand and to think, right, this is anyone... What you're, who you really want to target is anyone who might ever travel, anyone who might ever go on holiday, anyone who might ever travel uh, to go uh, for work purposes, um, anyone who is of age that they can travel, and most importantly, anyone that has money. But you can define that audience, and you can buy that audience and optimise against that audience effectively. Uh, then in terms of a drinks brand, uh, for an alcoholic drinks brand, your largest addressable audience, uh, I would argue, would be anyone of legal drinking age who likes to drink. Uh, it's a fairly broad audience, but in terms of where you would go and targeting, legal drinking age, anyone who wants to drink. Coming down one stage, you then want to think about, OK, we're talking to that audience. The next stage is how do we tar target an audience with some commercial intent? At some point where the mindset will be, they're kind of getting into category and they're kind of thinking about what, they're, what they'll be doing. So in the case of a hotel, that is clearly going to be anyone that is researching either a holiday or a business trip. Uh, and we know there are enough signals around our digital channels to help us define that audience. Uh, in the case of a drinks brand, for me this becomes uh, less about using digital signals and more about just using common sense and thinking about the targeting of the brand. Because actually, you would be targeting a drinks brand any time around Friday nights, Saturday nights, when the weather is hot, when it's someone's birthday, when it's a barbecue, when it's Tuesday, when you have finished work, any occasion we would choose to celebrate, which thankfully for a UK audience is quite a lot of times. There is a big audience for you to think about targeting. Then we move down one more level and you think about do. Okay, what would my do audience be? So again with a hotel brand, this is certainly where you've got brands, where you've got an online transaction. This becomes a lot easier to understand because here really is where I think a lot of digital media has been traditionally playing and playing very well. This is for kind of how do you optimise for the last click? How do you make that absolutely work? And what communication are you doing there to make that work and to make that work effectively? But even for a drinks brand, I think this is interesting um, because actually how are people using mobile? How are people using messaging? Because for me, this do brand is the second someone walks into a bar. It's the second someone walks into a drinks aisle of a supermarket. Um, and having worked on drinks brands, one thing that rarely changed was that the decision of which actual brand to buy is made in the five seconds between entering a bar and walking up to a bar. So there's clearly a lot of clatter and stuff around there, but there's still a real opportunity to think about how you target and how you use your communications at the D stage. And then finally, on to care. So there is different ways of uh, defining consumer loyalty or lifetime value, and everyone will do it in a different way. Um, Two ways I was thinking here. Um, certainly when you've got transactional clients, one of the ways sometimes we think about doing it is it's any client that's bought with you twice. The first time, if they bought with you, it may be because they had no choice or they wanted to try you out. If they buy a second time, that's kind of suggesting a sense of loyalty. So when you've got that kind of customer loyalty, then you start to think about how you target with them. Again, with brands where, you don't, where your purchase isn't necessarily online and most of your sales are offline, 
this loyalty one can be a harder nut to crack, definitely, and I agree with that. But there I think, um, and I'm not saying this is your only role for branded content, but that's where branded content becomes quite interesting for certain brands because if you're getting a regular viewer of your branded content, I would argue that could be akin to loyalty and you may want to think about how you adjust uh, your campaigns to suit that. So, a framework, see, think, do, care about understanding how you're organising your communications and the different objectives you're wishing to achieve with them. Once you have that framework, then you can start to map onto the framework the different channels you may wish to use to help you achieve those different objectives. Now, the listing I put up there is uh, pretty much a generic listing of most channels you will see. So please do not take this as a media recommendation for me saying how any of this works. But it is to give an understanding of what you would be doing and how it would work. Um, and it would, should help you answer some very uh, fundamental questions about your marketing mix and the way you're working and what you're doing. So certainly, I think, one of the questions we, we would all be asked is content strategy. Do you have a content strategy? If you do have a content strategy, what is your content strategy and what should you be doing? Is it working to engage with a C audience? Are you trying to inspire an audience who one day may want to engage with your brand? Or are you actually thinking of using your content strategy to engage and reward more loyal customers and more care? Because there is a distinct difference about the channel you would be using and the type of content you would be producing uh, to achieve those goals. Uh, if you think about your search strategy, my hunch would be virtually everyone's search strategy would, should be optimised around here and absolutely working effectively here and here. Is there more work that can be done around think and understanding when people may be engaging with a category and how that would work and how you may be expanding your keyword list? Uh, thoughts also about social media. If you have a social media strategy, what is your social media strategy doing? What is the purpose of it on the plan? What is the role of it on the plan and understanding it? So this framework gives us a very easy way to start to plot different channels to different clear objectives to understand which each channel is on there, what it's doing on the plan, and how it should be achieved. Then once we have this, the final layer we can add on to the top of it, is to understand the different measurements that we'd want to put and the ones that we would find important to judge against. Now again, I'm not suggesting these are the right measurements. These are some ge generic measurements that we would put up. There will be different measurements for all of your businesses. There will be different ways you will judge success. But there are some consistencies that you would probably want to consider. So for C, I would imagine you would want to be looking at brand awareness. You would want to be looking at your uh, brand sentiment. You would want to be understanding what impact that channel would have on driving awareness and sentiment. Where it comes down to care, actually, you would want to understand how that was driving repeat purchases you would want to understand whether people would be sharing content and whether they'd be likely to recommend your brand. Are your loyal customers likely to evangelise about your brand or not? So there's a whole set of different measurements that you would be setting up against that framework. So, you understand what you want to do, you understand the objectives you have, you understand the channels you want to use, and you understand the measurements you want to have. What I wanted to wrap up on and finish is just to talk a bit about some of the tools we use and some of the tools that we have and we have developed and also some of the studies we have and have developed to help us understand um, and to help you and to work with you um, in the measurement. And some of these I'm sure some of you may have already used, but if not, I would please urge you to use them. So the first one I wanted to talk about was brand lift surveys. Um, so how many people in the room are aware of brand lift surveys or have used them? Okay, okay, so it's, it's a smattering, so it's good. Um, just to give a, an update then on those who have used it and for those who have not, brand lift surveys are, are a brilliant way, basically, of understanding the impact uh, that your YouTube activity is having on your campaign. Um, so it will be set completely live for you. There's nothing that you need to do to set this campaign up. Um, and the way that it will work is that um, a control group of people who have not been exposed to the ad and a group that have been will be asked questions, understanding um, in terms of campaign awareness, uh, in terms of brand awareness, um, and also um, we track um, user intent as well by looking at search behaviour against exposed group versus the um, underexposed group. So you have an understanding of exactly um, the impact that your campaign is having 
in terms of your brand awareness, but also your intent. Um, in terms of this, will now be rolled out cross-device. It hasn't always been uh, available on mobile, but this is now being rolled out cross-device, so we can track and understand the impact of viewing it on mobile. Um, and in terms of spend, this is, uh, this is our gift, a gift to you, basically. In terms of all we really look for and understand is um, we obviously need a certain robustness in the data to make sure we get a read on what's going on and to understand it. And so a spend, we, we kind of recommend a spend of about £10,000 uh, a week to get a robust kind of reading and understanding, but otherwise absolutely no cost uh, to yourselves for having research as part of the campaign. Um, and it's as close to real time as we can make it. So as soon as we can get the data and interpret it, the data can be sent out so you can optimize uh, and understand what is going on. Um, it's a fantastic way of really um, unpicking the impact that YouTube is having uh, on your campaigns and really understanding the impact it's having on your brand metrics and your brand sentiment. And then three other areas um, that I wanted to talk, um, talk to you about. So we are doing um, a fair amount of work at the moment around brand uh, search and understanding the impact that search has on brand metrics. So there are two projects underway. So one of them is specifically working um, with certain clients to understand uh, the impact that their search activity is having on their brands. So again, their brand sentiment, their brand awareness, how people feel towards their brand, um, and understanding how different um, search activity will impact on that. Uh, so that is research that's being um, undertaken at the moment, um, and as soon as the results are available, that will be released to the market. So again, we'll have a, a much firmer understanding of how search activity impacts overall brand um, sentiment and um, overall awareness. The second thing we are doing around search, uh, as I referenced him uh, earlier in the presentation, uh, we've been working uh, with Les Binet on a white paper to understand how we can use search as a barometer for both brand health and business health. Um, so that is work that's being undertaken at the moment uh, and that we're looking at. So please watch this space for a white paper that will be published uh, before the end of the year. Um, Google Analytics, uh, again, quick show of hands, I would imagine most people in the room are aware of Google Analytics and are using it, okay. Uh, Google Analytics is absolutely a uh, brilliant set of tools which allow you to do a whole range of things um, from understanding, setting up tagging, uh, to understanding where your traffic's coming from, helping you improve your apps, uh, to basically uh, improving lifetime value of a customer. Uh, obviously within Google Analytics, there are tests that you can do to help you understand the different things that are going on. So simple testing like geographical testing, so running some things in certain areas and not in other areas to understand the impact, as well as if we think back to the example I was giving about a drinks brand, uh, you can also run time of day testing to really understand the impact certain activity is happening and how that would work. Uh, so Google Analytics um, can work effectively uh, and clearly should be used as part of all of the campaign planning that you're doing. And then finally, um, one other piece of research we are undertaking uh, and again, the results will be published to the industry, is uh, we are working with Kantar um, to really, um, to basically do some media mix modeling with YouTube uh, because we want to understand clearly the impact uh, that YouTube is having within the, the, the marketing mix. Uh, so we are working um, to understand kind of classic things you would see from an econometric model. Uh, so not only the additional awareness, um, but YouTube will deliver on a plan, uh, but also, um, how it will impact on sales and how it drives sales, um, and also ROI. So again, all, all results will be shared with the industry when that is ready. But as a mix, we're kind of really committed to making sure we understand how our products and, and how digital is really helping and working with you to drive strong brand growth and sales. So in conclusion, um, I wanted to leave um, I was aware I hadn't put a quote up in the presentation, which felt slightly remiss of me. So um, I wanted to leave you with, uh, with this quote um, because I feel if I've learned anything actually from joining Google in the last year, um, as, we, as we move ever forward into a kind of slightly different media landscape, um, the amount of time we actually spend thinking 
about what we're measuring has to increase. We have to really, if anything, I would be saying measurement should really be at the forefront of our thinking when we think about any kind of communication we're making. Because uh, if I'm honest, 20 years ago, when TV really was the dominant media in the landscape, um, it was harder to make a mistake with the investment of money because if it ended up on TV, it was kind of going to work and you kind of knew it was going to work. Um, that world is changing. We know that world is changing and if you're not successfully thinking about how you're going to measure the results of where the different uh, money is being spent, um, then you could find yourselves in a situation where you really don't know what the effectiveness of your marketing um, investment is. And I found it kind of reassuring, uh, but a bit scary, uh, when Melanie said earlier that even herself, she finds it intimidating just the amount of channels that are out there, uh, the amount of different platforms that she needs to be on just to maintain that kind of awareness. Um, and her biggest investment is clearly an investment of time, but you need to think your investment of money, we only have a finite amount of money. So if we're not really thinking about how we successfully invest and track and understand success, uh, then you find yourself in a situation where you um, quite quickly don't understand the impact your marketing spend is having. Thank you.